America celebrated Independence Day last weekend, but under the shadow of the COVID crisis. With his handling of coronavirus under sustained attack, the economy tanking, and Democrat challenger Joe Biden miles ahead in the opinion polls, we ask senior legal advisor to Trump 2020, Jenna Ellis, and key Republican strategist Ed Martin, just how much trouble is Trump in? Join us on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire in Scotland, where today we turn our gaze across the Atlantic. Last weekend, America celebrated Independence Day with fireworks, but still a long shadow was cast over the proceedings by the coronavirus crisis. And the toll of the pandemic is massive, with 135,000 already dead and the rate of infection rising, not falling, across most states. It should be said that even that horrendous death toll is still less per head of population than many European countries, including the United Kingdom. However, the pandemic has also cast its long shadow over the re-election prospects of Donald J. Trump, with the economy tanking, his handling of the COVID crisis under sustained attack, and the election only four months away. The Democrat challenger Joe Biden enters the home straight with a comfortable opinion poll lead. In a future programme, we'll look at the Democratic campaign in depth. But today we ask key Republican strategists, how much trouble is Trump in? But first to Glasgow and Tasmina with your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. We've had some lovely responses to our show last week, featuring Professor Sir Jeff Palmer racism. OBE. Lynn says, what an inspiration Professor Palmer is. So glad he's a Scot. Nigel says, Sir Jeff Palmer developed this process of barley brewing, historian, activist, and fought racism most of his life. Truly one of the great living Britons we have. We could learn from the gentleman. Foysel says, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, president of Elric, answered Alex Salmon's questions very well on how to combat racism and succeed. Habib comments, great interview. I basically agree with his take on statues. I think that perhaps it should be put together in a museum with plaques and videos recounting the history and stories of slaves. Seal makes the point that I think the statues should remain in their places, but placards of the truth should be placed beside them with the ugly truth that's behind them. Martin says, I saw Sir Jeff Palmer speaking at the Beer Matters Convention in 2019. He's such a great spirit, laughing and smiling all the time, with fascinating knowledge. A brilliant guy. Lizanne says, thanks, Prof Palmer. Enjoyed your interview. Ian Bruce says, great show. Real humanity and genuine people. I look forward to it every Thursday. Well, thank you, Ian. Poor Tabul says, cheers, Sir Jeff. Ronnie Bambri says, excellent interview. I will say cheers to Professor Jeff Palmer every time I partake of a beer. Jacqueline McGee comments that she is moved by this interview. And Mike says, Jeff's a legend at Heriwalt University and across the world. And finally, Carol says, My conclusion? Everyone in this world deserves a sense of belonging and have a chance to educate others. Only four months until the election and the Democrat challenger has a clear lead in the polls. But can President Trump turn it round? For the answer, I turn first to key Republican strategist Ed Martin. Ed has served as chairman of the Missouri Republican Party and as a a member of the Republican National Committee. In 2016, he co-authored the New York Times bestseller, The Conservative Case for Trump. Ed Martin joins me from the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Ed, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Great to be with you, Alex. Thank you. Now, Ed Martin, there's four months to go until the presidential election. The president seems to be behind in the, the polls to his Democratic challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden. The 
Coronavirus situation seems not to be going well with 40,000 new cases a day. How much trouble would you say President Trump is now in electorally? It's unprecedented. You know, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has hit America hard. The economy, which was really one of the great selling points of the president, has been, you know, hit very hard. It's a really tough race. You know, usually in America, the incumbent president has, has the real advantage because he has the stature in the office. We tend to reelect presidents. In this case, the man in charge is probably going to get some of the blame for what's gone wrong. But I think the president has a really tough race. It is, a, it is going to be a, a, a very busy 17 weeks. Uh, as I mentioned, you're uh, the co-author of the conservative case for Trump, a, a, a bestseller. Uh, and, and you're also president of the Eagle Forum, the conservative interest group. But would you describe uh, Donald Trump as a, a traditional American conservative in the, in the tradition of Barry Goldwater or, or Ronald Reagan, or, or is his politics somewhat different? Well, I think his history is very different from a conservative. You know, when he was in um, in uh, his youth, he, he was pro-abortion, for example, pro-choice. Uh, but he talked about that as a change he had about 10 years ago. And I, look, when I wrote that book, The Conservative Case for Trump, as you and I were talking off the air, I was addressing the, the slice of the Republican coalition that are more conservative, traditional family values, traditional roles. And I was trying to, I knew there would be a political battle. The book came out on September 5th, 2016, and I knew it would be necessary during those last two months when the politics really heat up. Donald Trump has been talking about the threat of China and the question of immigration, not for two years or five years, but for 25 years. So I think he fits into a, a brand of conservative that the Republicans used to embody. And I think he's kind of shaken up the party, though. You, you know, the Republican Party is in a transformation, too, or at least a battle over its future. That can be said, certainly. But for some time, the, the president's had an uneasy relationship with the Republican establishment, people like the uh, George Bush or Mitt Romney. He also seems more recently to have uh, infuriated some of the neocons, uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, the, the difficulties he's been having with John Bolton the, of, of late. Uh, is that a, a real problem for the, the president? Is he narrowing the base of republicanism as he bids for re-election? I believe the president is changing the Republican Party back to what its conservative roots were. We we cannot, and, and the people don't want it. We don't want more wars. We don't want the interventionist thing. We don't actually believe, as the neocons do, that we can somehow magically go in and change everybody's a, a culture in their world, in their nation, and make it better. So I was, if you ask me a different question, I was disappointed that John Bolton was asked to serve in the administration. I think the president sometimes likes to, to, to bring people closer that have differing positions to try to keep everybody off balance, that was a loser idea. So, I, and look, back to one thing, Alex, to tell you, our, the policies of the president have been conservative. That's a dramatic uh, conservative shift in American life that we have, you know, we will, we will bear the fruit for many decades. The president's under attack from the Democrat Party as being uh, soft on Russia, soft on China. If you look back to Republican candidates, uh, nobody ever accused Barry Goldwater of being uh, soft on the Soviet Union, just the opposite. The Democratic attack on Goldwater was that he was a warmonger. Isn't there something very different as opposed to that line of tradition that you point to in the politics of Donald Trump? Well, I mean, I just make one observation. I mean, uh, the Soviet Union, it doesn't exist. It's uh, that what you see out of Russia is a very different nation. And I, and I think the president recognizes that. Obviously, Russia is a, a major superpower, both its its uh, history as well as its nuclear power. And, and so you've got to relate to them differently than others. But I, I just think the president is right on that, that there's that's not our enemy anymore. In fact, frankly, you watch the conduct between Russia and America, and you think, why aren't these two nations allies and friends they've got more in common than not as opposed to china you know which is what they're what they're communist china when they're on the march the criticism in america is very lazy now it's not a criticism about what the president's policies are it's a it's this slur russia hoax well the russia hoax was debunked it's coming back again i mean at this a certain point you have to say one thing in america that's very disturbing for me uh, alex and i'm sure you see this from your career and what you do now 
the media in America really has been shown to be partisan. They're against the president in a way that a critical media, critical media is helpful, but a media that's part of the, the, the process. And, and in America right now, the media is making Americans unwell by lying about a lot of different things, and it's always against the president. So we've got a real uh, tension in this country because we love our free speech and our freedom of press, but it's, uh, it's very, very poorly serving we the people right now. But Ed, wouldn't you say that the media was rather polarized as opposed to all being against the, the president? I mean, there's plenty of conservative commentators or, or cheerleaders for, uh, for Donald Trump, are they not? The American media, including Fox, has a vision that's, in my mind, is anti-Trump. The, the Fox guys, the Murdochs, it's pretty well known. They're not conservative. And their vision, again, is, is more towards uh, the open borders and to the globalists, you know, the world, the, the global market. So, I, look, I, I, I can criticize Fox, too, but I think we, what we're seeing from CNN, for example, and from the other media is just broad distortions of what's happening. I mean, they even can't cover the fact that the, the, the protesters, hundreds of thousands of protesters, Protesters, there, of course, there's been a, a growth in the coronavirus after that. They won't cover that. They literally won't cover it. So it's a, it's a funny moment where the press is more of a partisan player, and Americans, I think, feel that on both sides. To be honest, let's let's come on to some of the current issues. Uh, above all, the pandemic uh, sweeping the world, certainly. But even the the president's greatest admirers uh, might have cause to criticize what looks like a very uncertain handling of the coronavirus pandemic. In America, we have this situation where the president who was, you know, taunted about being a strong man didn't move to sort of take over the whole nation. He let different states handle it differently. I think that's been a little bit mixed, right? In places where uh, there's, there's an easier time handling some of our more sparsely populated states, it's worked out. But in New York and Texas and Florida, it's a challenge. So I, I don't know, um, you know, a, a once in a hundred year pandemic, it's not easy to see how to handle it. And I think he's struggled with that. So I think that's a fair criticism. The question is whether the American people recognize a once in a hundred year pandemic and say, well, we're all doing the best we can, or whether they say, let's try somebody else. I think that's what's going to happen in the fall, that decision. And how about the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, again, this does not seem to be something with which the, the president has a natural empathy. It, it might offer opportunities for a, a, a law and order ticket, but, but nonetheless, there is a, a large body of opinion which points to something very wrong in the some aspects of American society that, that needs tackling. If there's a bad cop, fine, prosecute them. But our system of keeping people safe, we've got to do it. Here's where I think the president's struggling. I think he wants to do what he did in D.C. when they tried to tear down uh, monuments at Lafayette Square. He got in the National Guard and he secured it and stopped. They're making a political stand here, not a stand about the future. And, what, and the way you can tell is ask them what they want. Defunding the police is not a real uh, request. Nobody's saying, you know, nobody take down the statue of Frederick Douglass, uh, one of our more prominent uh, African American, you know, historic figures. That's what happened over the weekend. So when you have someone that doesn't tell you what they want, what they really want to do is destabilize the country. And this is a political movement. It's not a movement about people. And I think that we have to be clear about it. But it's a very tough thing to do when you're the president. Handle it. And finally, Ed Martin, does the president's chances of re-election depend on really getting the focus away uh, from the pandemic, uh, away from the, uh, the debate on Black Lives Matter and back onto the economy? And is that going to be possible over a period of four months uh, when the impact of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, makes economic recovery extremely problematic. I'll tell you what I've said for a long time. I don't think Trump derangement syndrome, you know, with the Russia hoax and all that stuff, is how the Democrats think they can win. I think they are trying to do Trump exhaustion syndrome, where the public is saying to themselves, gosh, there's a lot gone on. Maybe that other guy will be a little bit less uh, dynamic and he's a little dopey, but he's calm, you know, he's peaceful, as opposed to the Trump phenomenon. I think that's more likely. but. We're going to see in 17 weeks, 
you know, this is a battle, a titanic battle about the direction of the country, too. So it's not going to be dull. And both candidates raised a record amount of money, about a quarter of a billion dollars each in the last three months uh, of their campaigning. So we're coming to this wild time. And who knows what happens in 17 weeks? Well, we'll get the popcorn uh, in and, uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah. watch from uh, uh, afar. Ed, Ed Martin from Washington, thank you very much for joining us and the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. It was a great pleasure. Join us after the break, where I'm joined by the senior legal advisor to the Trump re-election campaign. Welcome back. I'm interviewing key Republican Party strategists about the re-election prospects of President Donald J. Trump. I'm now joined by Jenna Ellis, a senior legal advisor to the Trump campaign 2020. Jenna joins me from Denver, Colorado. Jenna, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to join you. Well, as a, a legal advisor to uh, President Trump's campaign, that must keep you pretty busy, given the amount of uh, attacks that he's been under. Yes, absolutely. And one of the biggest issues that the campaign is working on right now is election integrity. Uh, we filed lawsuits in a wide variety of states uh, to make sure that the protections and the safeguards around the ballot box are secured for every voter. And so uh, regardless of uh, who any uh, one person is supporting, it is a fundamental protected uh, right and privilege in America to be able to cast a ballot uh, for those who will represent us. And so the Trump campaign is making sure that uh, the Democrats are not removing those safeguards and uh, are not allowing more opportunity for fraud heading into November. So that's one of the biggest issues that we're working on. We have a website dedicated to that. It's called protectthevote.com, where you can learn more about the lawsuits and about where we're fighting and about election integrity. Now, Jenna Ellis, uh, there's four months to go until the, the election, the presidential poll. Most uh, opinion polls uh, show a, a, a gap between uh, challenger Joe Biden and President Trump. Uh, the coronavirus situation does not look uh, like it's under control. How much trouble is the President Trump in with regard to his election prospects? Well, so we learned from the last election in 2016 that uh, polls can be very, very biased by the fake news media and by uh, outlets that try to uh, twist them and try to manipulate them into showing uh, President Trump at a disadvantage. And so our internal polling at the campaign, and now, uh, you know, we care about actually seeing what's going on, the, the truth of the motivation behind the president. And so I think we can learn from 2016 that the polls uh, are definitely biased. Uh, but in terms of the coronavirus, um, you know, the president, at every step of the way, he's been decisive. Um, he's provided uh, recommendations, uh, support, and resources to the states. And in our system of federalism, uh, the federal government provides those recommendations and resources for the nation. And it's up to the individual state governors to then implement those recommendations in the best way for their communities. Uh, I think the American people are very confident um, if they look at the genuine facts, not the propagandist activist media that's spinning the story. Uh, there we and all of us are very confident that President Trump, yeah, Trump has done President such a great job uh, leading us through this. And I think he will uh, build the economy. We've looked at the jobs numbers over the last few months, of course. Uh, the, the fake news media was saying that the, the jobs numbers were going to be terrible. And uh, for the past two months, they've been surprised and they've had to uh, actually report those. And it was great to see that some of, uh, some of them had to actually <laughs> report that when uh, we could compare and contrast what they were saying before. Now, you use the term fake news media, uh, and you're known yourself for your feisty performances on CNN into the lion's den, as it were. But surely some of the networks are pretty favorable to President Trump, like Fox, uh, for example, and there are many conservative commentators. So doesn't uh, uh, President Trump get a, a pretty fair deal from some sections of the media? And surely it's more a question that the media is polarized as opposed to all being against the president? There are some that are more fair, and there are definitely some journalists uh, in Washington that, um, that I respect, that I deal with uh, often, uh, but they're few and far between, unfortunately. And even on Fox News, you know, the president um, has been very outspoken on Twitter that uh, there are some 
uh, anchors there and there are some uh, particular shows that uh, that aren't really fair in terms of uh, their editorializing some of those stories. I mean, it's it, there's a difference, of course, and you know this as a journalist, there's a difference between reporting facts and then letting the viewers decide versus shaping the narrative and painting a picture in a way that leads the viewer to believe something that really isn't true or trying to shape their opinion. And so the mainstream media doesn't want to report fairly and accurately on President Trump because they are uh, they are buying into uh, the Joe Biden left. And that's unfortunate that media is no longer independent, uh, that they're a tool um, of propaganda and activism, like what you saw on that interview in CNN. But in terms of the subjects of the day and the celebrations, the firework celebrations for Independence Day weekend, uh, weren't they rather overshadowed by coronavirus cases still running at 40,000 uh, new cases uh, a day? And while much of the handling of the epidemic is at state level, as you rightly say, surely there's a, a leadership role for the President of the United States. Shouldn't he, for example, be telling people to wear face masks at his, uh, at his rallies, including the one coming up in New Hampshire next weekend? Well, so uh, President Trump has made very clear himself, as well as through the CDC, that um, you know if Americans want to wear masks and they uh, they want to have those recommendations, um, then he's all for that. And in terms of his own event, so I was at the Mount Rushmore event, which was a celebration of our national founding and our liberties. And there at Mount Rushmore, it was an open event uh, outside, and um, you know, and so masks were provided; they were optional. And um, at the rally coming up in New Hampshire, that's also going to be an outdoor event and uh, masks uh, will uh, be optional as well because it's outside but we always take uh, safety precautions as well with uh, hand sanitizer fever checks and uh, making sure that you know it's it's a voluntary event and so people can come and uh, you know if they are part of that demographic that is more uh, likely to, to get the virus or they're more at risk for the virus then they can stay home and watch on television and so you know we live in a country where we have those choices and opportunities and and so we're taking um, every reasonable safety precaution. Now, Jenna Ellis, you're a, you're a doughty lawyer in uh, Donald Trump's interests. Uh, and some Democrats have argued that the purpose of all these legal suits about voting is a, a, a plan being hatched by President Trump to, if he lost the, the ballot, to take the election into the House of Representatives by stymieing the, the Electoral College. Can you take this opportunity to say that there is no truth in that accusation whatsoever and that is not a part of a, a cunning plan being hatched in the White House? <laughs> so President Trump, uh, he is always upholding our rule of law, our Constitution, which provides the electoral college system as our way to elect our United States president. And these lawsuits are for the purpose to make sure that we preserve and protect the sanctity of the ballot and make sure that every eligible voter in the United States uh, has access to the ballot, votes once, and that their vote is counted. And that's the promise of America, is that we, the people, with our government of the people, by the people, and for the people, get to select and prefer who is in office to represent us. And the problem here is that Democrats want to manipulate the rules. They know that they can't win freely and fairly, so they have to try to rig the system. And this, um, using the coronavirus pandemic as a pretext to then push through a nationwide mail-in ballots, that's where the Democrats are trying to undermine our U.S. Constitution. They're trying to undermine the vote. We should all, as Americans, be confident and secure in our free and fair elections. And that's what President Trump is driving toward. I can ask you, Jenna Ellis, when, when you were looking at the, the Bolton book, were, were you looking as a, a generally interested reader or were you in a more professional capacity as one of the president's legal advisors thinking about taking legal action against it? 
Well, you know, both, honestly. And so, you know, I was looking at it, um, you know, from the perspective of a reader to see, you know, is there any sort of, um, you know, substance to this? And also, you know, frankly, as an attorney, I used to be, um, you know, more of a trial tr attorney. I used to be a prosecutor, um, actually here in the state of Colorado. And, you know, when anyone puts forward a claim, then you have to determine uh, the credibility of the person offering that claim. You have to look at what proof they're offering. And John Bolton's credibility um, on both sides, uh, Democrats, um, you know, refuse to confirm him uh, because of his credibility issues. Um, he's had, you know, a wide variety of credibility issues. And then uh, for him to just offer his own opinion as proof and just say, you know, this is what I perceived, um, you know, that's not really substantive. That's something that is an individual, um, his, his just his opinion, and he can offer that, but that doesn't mean that it's correct, and that doesn't mean it's substantive. It doesn't mean it's fact. And so, for the American people looking at this, I think that his uh, lack of credibility preceded him. And um, although it was um, absolutely correct, what an independent judge actually found that he had put um, his own personal interests and his own financial interests uh, with the money that he received from, from the book ahead of national security interests. And the only reason that the judge in that case denied the Department of Justice's lawsuit um, to try to prevent uh, that book from being distributed before it had gone through a national security proper vetting was because the book had already been leaked. But that judge's objective commentary, I think, speaks volumes when he said that John Bolton was wrong. Finally, Jenna Ellis, the president has also been criticized for not articulating a rationale for, for being given a second term by the American people. Uh, as one of his key advisors, what would you say that that vision should be for the, the next four months of the campaign to make the argument for a, a Trump second term? I think the president's put it very clearly, especially in his Mount Rushmore speech and over the weekend. Um, he's consistently said America first. In any civil society, you have to have laws and you have to have a mechanism to enforce them for them to be meaningful. He understands that those are the duties of his office that any president should support. And that is the campaign message, is that either you are voting for America and freedom and liberty with President Trump, or you're voting against liberty and for the chaos and the riots that we've seen in these Democrat cities. So the message is preserve and protect liberty and freedom, keep America first, and we're gonna keep driving home that message of law and order. And President Trump is gonna do a great job and we have four more months and uh, we're looking forward to um, a wonderful victory in, on November 3rd. Jenna Ellis from Denver, Colorado. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Just four months ago, President Trump would have been pretty confident about his re-election prospects. The grueling impeachment bid had finally been fought off. The economy seemed set fair for continued growth. And the coalition which elected him was waiting to be reassembled. Now with four months to the election, the clock is running down. COVID has blown a hole in the economy and the cost of getting it moving again has been a renewed surge in the deadly virus. Even his greatest admirers would hardly give President Trump We've pass marks for his handling of the coronavirus crisis, although well. this president would dearly love to mark his own homework. Trump is in trouble, and the problem is not that the opinion poll gap is unbridgeable. It isn't. The real problem is that the conditions which created it are unlikely to change before November. And so from Tasmina, myself and the rest of the crew, it's goodbye for now. Stay safe. We'll see you again next week.